Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katya, Katya Olenik. I'm from Boston University. And uh, it looks like we have a record number of participants, 84 today. Uh, uh, I and I feel this is at least in part by great work of Bob and Claire. Uh, more and more people are interested in uh, this track, but also to a uh, very interesting topic uh, or that we, we will be covering today on demand, using on demand for supercomputing. And um, we have Alan from Ohio Supercomputing Center, Sean from Taft University, Blake from University of Arizona, Robert, uh, from Virginia Tech and uh, Mike Dugan from my colleague from Boston University um, uh, joining us today uh, who will be uh, talking about uh, their experience of um, using on demand. And uh, what uh, the, the plan for today's session would be, uh, we have uh, prepared questions. Uh, and first, Alan will talk, as Alan has to leave early, so he will talk uh, for a few minutes about on demand. Uh, and then we will go question by question. So each question will be um, covered by one of uh, every person uh, on um, this list. And uh, we will, after the end of each question, we will select one maximum two questions from the audience and one panelist will answer the one who uh, feels most strongly about that. We will be collecting uh, what I think the best way to deal with all the questions. If we cannot answer all the questions during that call, I think we will, uh, the best way uh, to uh, make sure that they're answered or at least discussed, if we uh, collect them through the shared document that Bob and Claire put in a Zoom chat. So let's, uh, you can add uh, your questions into the chat and if we have time, we will uh, uh, try to answer those questions uh, in, in the session, but otherwise, let's just collect those questions in the document, okay? And uh, at this time, I think uh, uh, I would like to uh, Alan to uh, say a few words in about on demand in general, and then we will uh, get into the very first question of the list. Okay, thank you, Katya. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. And and actually, I am here as long as you need me to be. So I ah, okay. and, and I'll also I'll also point out I'm to uh, everybody on the call that I don't turn into a pumpkin at the end of the call. Um, I am accessible. My colleagues are accessible. So. Um, any questions that come up later or that we can't answer, we'd be happy to, uh, to have discussions with you. Oh, perfect. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen for just a second here because uh, Martin said that I could uh, show a few slides. I recognize many of the names uh, of the 84 or so people that are on, but there's many I don't. So I'm going to try to, in a whirlwind, uh, five minutes cover open on demand for those who don't know anything about it maybe also share some stuff for those of you who do know about it. Uh, so Open On Demand uh, is a, a program that is supported by NSF and we do have a, a website that if you haven't been to, I encourage you to, to go to, which is openondemand.org. Uh, let me see if I get my slides to advance here. Uh, there we go. Uh, in a nutshell, we are providing open interactive HPC via, via the web. So we are trying to uh, make it easy for people to use web-based resources to access uh, supercomputers. And there's a whole bunch of features, and I'll real quick go through some of these, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about them some more. Um, the features that we have kind of fall into two general categories, and we refer to those as interactive apps versus cluster access. So interactive apps are providing you the ability to get into things like RStudio, Jupyter, just various applications. Uh, whereas cluster access are, are more low-level things like accessing files and editing, moving them around, managing jobs, SSH, uh, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the architecture, I could spend a whole afternoon talking about that, but I just wanted to uh, mention, and, and again, on the website, we have these slides, we have a whole white paper about the architecture, but what makes on-demand unique, I think, from any other science gateway is this part uh, that's to the right here, which is server backends. 
Um, it's the per user nginx. So once you authenticate and log in to an on-demand installation, everything behind the scene is running as that user. Uh, so you, it's everything is relying upon just basic Linux system groups, security, things like that, because you're running as that user. So, so it gives us an inherent uh, kind of flexibility and security as opposed to many other gateways that, that everything's running as a root user that then has their own internal uh, uh, management of what people can and can't do. Uh, in terms of the impact of on-demand, <clears throat> uh, we've got now, this is actually an old chart, uh, the vast majority of the clients here at OSC uh, access our resources via on-demand. It's uh, something on the order of about 1,200 per month. Uh, and we did a survey or analysis of, of our users in 2017 and found that clients that came in, new clients that were using on-demand, their time to science was significantly improved in terms of the amount of time between account creation and first login and first job compared to traditional SSH. So that's what this is really about, is, is lowering that barrier to entry, um, making that time to science faster. Uh, based upon our RPM logs, we know that our open on-demand has been downloaded at about 136 U.S. locations, 70 unique locations. I will make a plea for everybody that uh, we really want to know if you're using it because, again, we're NSF funded. Building a community is really important. And so I'd love for you to self-identify specific institutions if you're running this in production or evaluating it because it really helps us with uh, our NSF program manager. Uh, we do know some of you, and so this is also on the website, and, uh, and uh, if your logo is not up here or it's in the wrong place, please, please, please let me know, uh, and happy to put it up there just to, to help uh, illustrate where all it's running and, and who, who's using it. Um, I'm going to uh, flip through the next few slides super fast because all they really say is that, hey, you can customize on demand. So uh, what you're seeing here on the right-hand side are three different instances of on-demand. You've got the OSC one on the lower right, you've got the PSC one for bridges in the middle, and then you've got a generic vanilla one. Uh, but you can see there's all kinds of things that you can uh, customize in terms of color, message of the day, announcements. Um, Feature-wise, these all can be turned on and off, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the, on the panel. Uh, but the features, core features that we provide are a file explorer, uh, cluster access, apps, and jobs. All of this is in HTML5, so you don't require any plugins. You can uh, access it from pretty much any device. I've got pictures of graduate students sitting in the bar with a pint of beer in one hand and their cell phone logged into On Demand in the other hand. Now, here in Ohio, it's not against the law to drink and compute. We don't condone it, but you can do it. Uh, so. You're just seeing here some screenshots. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through gory details, but this is kind of what the file explorer looks like. Uh, this is what some of the shell access, all the, what you're seeing here is the OSC instance of it. Uh, this is what an example app for Paraview might be. Uh, this is our job composer. Um, and then I, I want to just take a minute or two and talk about uh, Open On Demand 2.0. So um, we had a three year SI2 award from NSF to open source on demand. We've been developing on demand for about a decade here at OSC, um, and we very much uh, run it in production usage. Uh, a little over a year ago, we were awarded a follow on uh, CSSI award. It's a five year award. Uh, we have collaborators with uh, SUNY Buffalo and Virginia Tech, and I know Bob is part of the panel and he'll be talking some of the Virginia Tech uh, perspective. And that five year program. The roadmap for that, we have four key areas that we are focused on. We have these catchy little names you can see here. So visibility, scalability, accessibility, and engagement. And I'll just kind of go up backwards up this list. So engagement is what I'm doing right now. It's what Bob's doing right now. We have budget set aside to talk to you, to help you get this deployed, to listen to you. Uh, if those of you that will be at SC19 next week, we're going to have a BOF, a user group meeting. Uh, come to the OSC booth. We're giving demos. Love to talk to you about it. We we, we want to talk about it. Uh, accessibility is making improvements to get n scientists and engineers in domains that traditionally don't use HPC, or don't use it enough, 
uh, using it more. So provide certain software or work, uh, walk through, uh, work through, sorry, workflows, things like that. Scalability is more behind the scenes stuff. We uh, have some prototypes of running this on the cloud, running this in Kubernetes, running this on a, a desktop, and we want to support uh, things like that, load balancing, a lot, lot of different features there. And then finally, visibility is an integration with the OpenXD mod platform. I want to just talk just two more slides about that. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, OpenXD mod was developed as part of Exceed to provide metrics on demand. Uh, it's out of the, the Buffalo folks. Uh, it's in use at about 200 uh, centers. And what our vision is, and we're very close to releasing our first uh, Kind of release, they'll make use of this. Uh, XDMod, they release, they came out with a new release uh, about a month ago that supports this, but we haven't pushed the open on demand release yet. But what it's going to do is it's, they're going to talk to each other. So this is a conceptual uh, dashboard of an open on demand uh, uh, instance that's pulling charts and data from open XDMod to provide the user with information about their jobs, their utilization, things like that. Um, this would be a conceptual active job manager where there's links on individual jobs to the, the appropriate analytics. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we're going. We're pretty excited about that. We are going to show a video uh, next week uh, about that actually in use because we've, we've got a prototype working now. So my final uh, slide is please, 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 uh, reach out, stay in touch. You can always go to our website. I always also encourage you to look at our discourse instance. There's a huge community that's sprung up around this that you can ask questions, you can look at threads, and, and if you have difficulty configuring something, it might be that somebody has already talked about that. Um, our mailing list, I, I push out announcements on there. Um, and then again, do not hesitate to reach out to us. If you're going to be at SC, come see us. Um, I, can't, I can't iterate enough that we have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of interest in this, but it's not necessarily all captured in all of these documents. So if there's a feature you want or have difficulty with, let us know, because it might be that it's already there, we just haven't documented it very well, or it might be that we're developing it and there's an early release version of it that you could play with. And that is it for my five minutes. <clears throat> You're you're muted, Katia. You're muted. Again, okay. Okay, I I clicked unmute and uh, it didn't work. Sorry. All right. Uh, thank you, Alan. It was very nice. One uh, comment that was in the chat that everyone wants to have your slide uh, afterwards. So Bob will. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's actually on the website. So if you go to the OpenOnDemand.org website, we have an overview presentation down at the bottom. Um, okay. I'll I'll actually. I'll, I'll put it up explicitly to say that it was part of this CARC thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So we have this list of questions uh, that we uh, would like every panelist uh, to answer relatively briefly, uh, but uh, feel free, uh, you know, to expand uh, if necessary. So, and uh, the first question uh, would be, how long have you been using OOD? and what hardware setup and authentication uh, are you using? And uh, let's start with Alan, since he was... <laughs> sure. So we've been using it as long as it existed, you know, for about a decade. Uh, the open source version we released in 2017. Uh, and in terms of our setup, we do detail that on our documentation webpage, but we run it on a relatively modest-sized VM. It's uh, doesn't have very many uh, virtual cores or uh, too much RAM, um, and it's configured like a like a login node. Uh, we do have Active Directory and connections to CI login. Thank you, uh, Sean. Oh, sorry about that. I'm always slow to unmute. Um, so yeah, I mean it's the same for Tufts. We have it on a KVM based virtual with four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, and um, it was initially half of that, and so we doubled everything just to give a little bit more leeway when people are uploading and downloading files. But honestly, with dozens of users, we've never really seen an issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Blake? Hi. Um, we have it running on a 4-gig dual-core VM, so it's even smaller than everyone else. 
Uh, and we haven't seen too many issues with ups and downs. Um, we're going to be switching to a new uh, all flash storage so that will also help, of course, um, and a few other things. But yeah, it's pretty small. And we've been running it, uh, I think we installed it back in uh, 2017 um, and got auth set up and various other things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Robert? Robert Sipulkate? Yeah, so <clears throat> we're very similar. I think we have a four core VM set up. We have three different instances going, so production, pre production, and then uh, dev. Um, yeah, so we've been going for just about a year. Uh, we went live uh, last January. Um, we initially had a little bit of struggle with install installs, but I think that was all sort of local um, security stuff uh, with how locked down we have our, our CentOS. Thank you. Mike? Mike, would, Mike you need to unmute yourself probably. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. No. Uh, um, so we, we just started about three months ago. Uh, and we're using an actual physical uh, server, basically a two-year-old compute node uh, at the moment. And let's see, we're, for authentication, we're using the campus uh, identity access management system. So Shibboleth is how we're doing our authentication. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, one question uh, that went through the chat. Uh, I'll uh, ask uh, that question and uh, one, uh, probably one panelist uh, uh, should choose uh, who want to answer it. The question is interested in knowing if anyone has been successful in containing a full desktop GNOME made inside the container, Singularity Docker, for use with OOD. Just want to be clear that X11 works fine, but I don't want to use X forwarding and server with container. I reached out to Singularity developer folks and they mentioned about Dbus being problem and asked me to reach out to GNOME community. Wondering if anyone in OOD community has been able to resolve this issue. Anyone? Uh, there was a lot packed into that question, so I, I don't know that we can answer okay. it yes. quickly, but I would encourage you to maybe post that question on our discourse instance so we can we can unwrap it. I know there's a lot of work going on at various sites regarding using containers. I know here at OSC we've made some really good progress with, for example, Kubernetes in particular, um, but I, without seeing the, the full text, I, I, I wouldn't want to try to answer it. Uh, Alan and everyone, I will post those questions that come through the chat also in our document so we could collect uh, questions that were not answered. Okay. Great. All right. So our next question is where any parts of the installation were the, uh, sorry, were the, any parts of the installation problematic? And if so how did you overcome those problems? Alan, you are. Sure. So uh, as I said earlier, we strongly believe in eating our dog food, so we run uh, multiple in-house production instances that have features that are still in development that we haven't released publicly yet, um, and we sometimes discover issues with that. Um, I, I'll just kind of make a call out for assistance here and that our biggest problem we face is that we we don't have access to all the different schedulers and resource managers. We, we currently are a, a Moab a, a Torque a shop here, and uh, when we want to test against something like Slurm or LSF, we have to run that in a VM or go to a friendly site. So if anyone wants to volunteer to give us accounts or, or test instances that we can run these things on, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, thank you. Sean? <laughs> Here we go again, slow on the mute. Um, yeah, we didn't have any real problems during the installation. Um, the on-demand staff uh, did the first install for us. And so we got to watch that and then we kind of duplicated it on the side. You know, it, it might be my sysadmin background or bias when I say we had, had no troubles and really thought the document 
was great. Uh, the only thing we had was fail to ban that we run locally started blocking all the uh, on-demand connections. And, and that really gave me brain freeze to debug. But that was certainly not uh, anything to do with on-demand. <laughs> Thank you. Blake? So I'll, I'll echo um, the scheduler specific issues. We, we run PBS Pro right now, but we'll be switching to Slurm pretty soon, I think. So with initial setup, it just, you know, we had to figure out the PBS Pro isms and how that worked with uh, open on demand. Um, and we had a lot of shibboleth, uh, trying to get shibboleth worked into place uh, kind of issues. But of course those aren't uh, the open on demand. Auth authentication is always kind of tricky. Thank you. Uh, Robert? Yeah, so like I said, the only real issues we had was I, I think sort of site specific in that we, um, our, our, our CentOS is really stripped down and so we didn't have a bunch of the RPM um, repos um, uh, sort of hooked up and so we, we had some struggle with that mostly because I think when we were uh, doing the install we were using sort of the non-default um, um, options, I guess. So the the documents were a little bit thinner if you 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 weren't using sort of the defaults. So we had some problems there. Um, we're on Slurm. We didn't really have problems with Slurm per se. It, it seemed to work, or it, it it that was pretty seamless. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see. We use uh, SunGrid Engine, so. I don't think uh, the support for that is uh, completely there yet. Let me put it that way. So they had a lot of little issues with just getting getting things working, uh, but we're working through them. And let's see what else. Early on, I had this. I, I couldn't find. Uh, let's see. I had to set LD library path somewhere in order to get the Ruby uh, library to be found, which I seem, I thought was kind of weird that I would have to do that, but I did put a comment in the document about that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are your uses of open on demand? Is it research, teaching, both, or maybe something else? Alan, how about your, your community? Sure, our, our clients span the gamut. So it's research faculty, uh, teaching faculty that they're using this as part of classes, uh, commercial clients. Um, we've got, I think right now, four different production instances of on-demand running here at OSC. And I'll mention two of them in specific. One is uh, dedicated to a very specific client. Their name is TotalSim. And it's very stripped down and only offers up certain apps that uh, allows them to kind of publish results to their clients. Um, the other one is uh, dedicated to a stats class here at OSU that wanted to provide uh, about 200 students with uh, access to um, uh, our studio. And uh, both of these are little short case studies we've got available on our OSU website or I can send. I do want to, real quick, make one other comment. I was going to put this in the chat. I'd love if people would not respond to everybody, but just send me direct chat messages telling me if they are running on demand. That would be an easy way for me to collect uh, kind of names and, and, uh, and institutions. So please consider doing that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sean? What was the question again? Uh, the question is, what are your uses of open on demand? Uh, do, uh, research, teaching, both, or something third? Sure, sure. So they're all across the board. We use a single instance in front of our general purpose cluster for researchers, instructional, workshops, faculty, student, staff. Um, and like I just mentioned in the chat window, we do have two instances split off in front of more sensitive, uh, smaller clusters for limited audience. Thank you. Uh, Blake? Um, so here at the University of Arizona, um, we have kind of everybody and their brother and sister using the machine. We had 838 users from 60 different, 64 different departments. Um, so we do teaching and 
training workshops and like hands-on things, but it's also used, of course, by many, many different kinds of researchers. Um, and kind of like what Alan's uh, kind of pointed out, when you're a beginning researcher, um, trying to learn how to use bash commands, how to actually run your compute, how to actually like wrangle the infrastructure side of things, how to transfer files, it all becomes really tangled. And so I think that's why our users use open on demand because it kind of presents a friendlier, uh, you know, a friendlier interface, right? And it's not just a literally a black box to them, you know, kind of a text adventure sort of thing. Um, and so if, in my case, I'm actually a geneticist uh, turned uh, computing administrator. But, uh, and so I remember three years ago, I knew no code. Um, and I know what, I remember what that felt like and trying to learn all these things at once. And so um, that's how we use it. And that's how we present it to a lot of our new users. And kind of like what Alan showed on his slides, I'm pretty sure that we could, if we did track the, the usage of open on demand, that it would be primarily our new users um, getting instant access to Jupyter Notebooks and to uh, our studio server. Um, we also have a, a very large um, astronomy and, uh, well, one of the biggest astronomy departments in the US um, and a fairly large GIS community. And they really like to be able to get the interface, you know, interactive interface for like point clouds and for doing uh, image analysis and uh, those sort of things. So we work a lot on trying to box up um, these interactive apps and then display them through open on demand. Um, and I think somebody was asking questions about that earlier. Um, I can certainly share my experience if you ever want to reach out. Um, and I never introduced myself. My name is Blake Joyce. I'm the Assistant Director of Research Computing. Thank you, Blake. Uh, Robert? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'd echo everything that was just said. Um, we, uh, our, our uses are both on uh, the academic teaching side and also on the research side. And um, what I'd say is just to start with, uh, what, what, what we noticed on the teaching side is post open on demand, um, what would take about a, uh, the full hour lecture to get a class sort of hooked up and into our clusters turns into about 15 minutes. So it's a, it's a completely different experience. So that, that's, that's been very rewarding. Um, we, we do it uh, for hackathons. That's been awesome. And so I, 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 I like to keep the focus of the hackathon on the topic at hand rather than on, you know, computing, um, uh, let's call them inconveniences. Open on demand does that perfectly, right? So we don't focus on how to get into compute, how to SSH in. We just open up on demand um, and in and, and we go. Uh, and so we can start to, to talk really about the topic of the hackathon rather than, you know, Virginia Tech, most likely um, HPC platform issues, that type of thing. Um, on, on the research side, uh, what, uh, what I am doing is, is kind of going across campus and sort of slowly, you know, bringing on friendly users and, and sort of letting the word of open on demand um, spread sort of organically as, as people have good experiences, tell their, you know, office neighbor or whatever. And that's, that's, that's working out uh, really well because the experience is so good. So I, 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 I appreciate that for that reason. Um, the, the only other thing I'd say here is at, at Virginia Tech, um, the way our clusters are set up, we're, we're fully two-factored into our clusters. And we, we have researchers that, that simply before couldn't use our clusters. And some of it was accessibility issues. So when you sit behind them and you kind of watch them type their password, they've got a long password and it takes them forever to type their password. And then, you know, out comes the phone or whatever for the two-factor and it's just a long time. And basically what happens is um, they, their session time's out. With open on demand, they go in in kind of the normal way through the web. They two factor in through the web, and then, as Alan mentioned, we already know who the user is, and so they're into the clusters. And so, researchers that maybe had accessibility problems getting into our clusters are not having those same issues with open on demand as the front end. Thank you, Mike. Um, well, like I said, we're we're just getting started, but uh, so it's available to everyone. Uh, the use cases that we, we kind of think it will be very useful for are for teaching and for doing tutorials. But uh, again, it, our, our longtime users that we've shown it to all like it. Uh, 
So I think they're going to want to use it as well. Yes, yes, and I I actually did uh, try to teach a few classes already. On the end, and uh, it's especially helpful with classes uh, that uh, have many students, like one class that I uh, was teaching was uh, had 100 students in. They really wanted to use Jupyter Notebook uh, on GPUs and run it interactively. So for them, even though they are computer science students and they are fully able to SSH and use Linux commands, but uh, starting uh, interactive session together with a Jupyter Notebook on a compute node uh, was uh, too long to explain them uh, and uh, took uh, a, long of t a long time out of the class session. So on demand really, really, uh, helpful in, in, in this particular instance. But as Mike said, uh, anyone who will show even on the research side, even though they already mastered all Linux commands, they all love it. So I, for the next uh, uh, question, I actually will combine, since they are very, very short, uh, uh, probably just one sentence, I will combine two questions. One is, uh, if you are monitoring usage, how many users do you ever, ever uh, have do you average daily? In the second, what features of on demand do your users use the most? So if everyone can say just a few words uh, to answer those questions, Alan. Uh, Katia, if you don't mind, there are two questions that were asked in chat that okay. I'd like to address before I answer okay. that. Is that, yes, is that okay? Sure. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, the, the, the first question that was actually sent to me privately that I said I will uh, speak to you publicly um, was whether we support or plan active or passive load balance setup for continuous operations. Um, that's most definitely on our roadmap. Um, I do know that there are one or two sites that have already experimented with using HA proxy to do load balancing. And I believe that's documented a bit on our discourse instance. So if you just search for HA proxy or load balancing, um, you'll be able to see that. We want to more formally support this absolutely in the next few years. Um, if it's a high priority thing, please, please, please let us know because we can move up the priority of it. I, I think it's probably at least a year or so out from when we would be, be publicly supporting it. Um, the other question that uh, got asked is real quick. Oh, how, do we support different user groups for different groups of researchers? Um, so absolutely. This is one of these examples of things that we have not well documented. We thought was inherently obvious until somebody asked this exact question of us uh, at the PERC conference in July. But because of the fact that uh, the, the whole thing runs as, as the user, your group permissions, particularly secondary group permissions, uh, can very robustly be used to hide or display certain features or menu items or things that show up. And we, we do this uh, quite extensively here at the o on the OSC's production instance. Um, it, again, happy to walk you through that. We just haven't documented it very, very well, but it's uh, not that hard of a thing to do. And there's some very slick and cool things you can do um, as a result of that to make sure that select groups can see certain things other groups can't. Okay. Um, oh, no, sorry. There's one final one, um, and that was this whole issue about shared versus local in, um, installs. Um, so, meaning not unique to the, uh, you know, is there an instance of this not unique to a single institution, um, multi-tenant? Uh, and uh, the, the answer there is, no, we don't have that yet, but stay tuned. Um, we are uh, in discussions and working with a, a group called Cloudy Cluster, which some of you might be familiar with. They spun out of, I think it was Clemson maybe, um, and they provide a, a mechanism for launching a virtual HPC cluster on either Amazon or uh, Google, and they're extremely interested in uh, having open on demand as the front end for that. I think that's something that I'd say probably in the next four to six months will be in production and accessible. So uh, I think I have handled everything for now. Next time around, I'll, if I, I'll get the next ones. But let me answer uh, Katia's question about 
monitoring and features. Um, we do monitor on a monthly basis on um, the OSC production uses. Um, we mainly use Splunk reports. We do use a little bit of Google Analytics for that as well. Um, and so in a typical month, we have about 1,200 unique users that use our systems, um, launching about 23,000 apps. Pretty much every feature is what we call an app. Um, and in the most recent month, uh, in order of, pre in order of uh, most used to least used, the top six apps that were used or features that were used, uh, top one was the Files app, next is the Shell, next was the File Editor app, um, next was the Active Jobs, then came Jupyter, and then came Desktop. So that's it for OSC. Thank you. Um, Sean, how about you? Sure. Um, about 14 to 15 percent of Tufts logins now from day to day are through on demand. And I would, you know, like to get that up to 90 or more for obvious reasons. We do track usage, um, not very fine grained, but um, I can dig through the logs and find out that the web based shell is by far the most utilized app followed by interactive apps, in particular, RStudio and MATLAB and Jupyter Notebooks. Then we have a catch-all menu with local things that we've written to show people their quota, partition descriptions, things like that. And then number four, because we have an older installation, no one has really caught on to using the job launcher. But when we update to the latest version, we'll be pushing that on more people. Thank you. Blake? So we don't track metrics, but uh, we, you know, have a HPC consult list that we sit on top of and help to, you know, answer questions for users. And uh, if Open On Demand ever has any troubles or if our VM gets stuck, we get emails immediately. So there's always somebody using it. I can say anecdotally, we probably have anywhere between 20 and 30 instances running because we're able to um, when people get onto either Jupyter Notebooks or RStudio or the interactive desktop, um, they schedule an interactive job through PBS. And so um, that we can see that on our side, um, and, you know, we, but we just don't collect those metrics. Um, and as for the most common usage, I think Jupyter Notebooks and RStudio are way out in the front. Um, we have a lot of uh, ecologists that use the RStudio server because that can be really tricky to set up on your local computer and even trickier on the HPC. Um, but I will say that the interactive desktop, we, we provide kind of a Linux, um, a CentOS sort of desktop, and that's becoming more and more popular uh, as people start to, to use that. Thank you. Uh, Robert? Yep, again, you know, very similar to the, the, last, uh, the last comments. Um, we don't actively monitor our, our our VM very well right now. Um, it will be hooked up to Splunk, but it's it's not hooked up today. What we do see is when we kind of look at a who on our login notes, we can see you know who's coming from uh, on demand, and um, a, I, I'd say on a normal day, probably 50 to 70 percent of the, the 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 people are coming in through on demand. So a pretty good number, pretty rapidly for, for how much um, we've advertised this. But that, that's probably heavily um, skewed by classes. Uh, so we're pushing this in classes pretty heavily because uh, it simplifies our life so much. Uh, in terms of the apps that I get more questions um, about, it's definitely Jupyter and, uh, and RStudio. Thank you. Mike? Um, OK. Um, so we really haven't done any broad advertisement yet, uh, but I just just to get some statistics, I just looked through the batch logs to, to so we've had about 123 unique users in the last month and a half. Uh, this is running interactive applications. So, and on a typical day, we might have like up to 10 or 15 apps running at a time. Yeah, and most successful, uh, more, more the, the applications that I use the most? Um, 
there's a lot of our studios running uh, as well as just the interactive uh, desktop apps. Thank you. Um, the next question, what are your outreach strategies and how successful are they? And Alan? Okay, I'm going to answer another question first again. So okay. uh, there's, a, there's a question about uh, any plans to enhance the job schedule interface. Oh, yes, absolutely. This is taking up a lot of our time lately. Um, all I can say is stay tuned. We have some very cool things coming. Um, if you have specific ideas, we'd love to hear them, but we realize that um, there's a lot that we need to do there, and that's probably amongst our highest priorities for, the, for that. Okay, so um, in terms of outreach strategies, um, yeah, this, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it right now, but more client-specific, there's kind of four uh, things that we do. All new clients at OSC get a, a welcome email that includes clear instructions on how to log into On Demand. Um, our client uh, portal where clients go to for accounting info and stuff and change your password has a very prominent button on there that links to On Demand. Uh, all of our training classes, both for new clients and for domain specific topics, utilize On Demand exclusively. And then finally, we regularly attend things like faculty orientations, day to days, departmental meetings, stuff like that, uh, to speak about OSC and, and, and On Demand. So that, that's kind of our outreach. Thank you. Uh, Sean? Yeah, so our uh, outreach consists of simply including the on-demand link and a short description in all of our new user engagements. We send out a small uh, PDF and box folder for them to access. And then, of course, it's the default method of access that we mention in any kind of document training. Uh, document Document training? Okay, I like that word. Documentation for training and workshops. Um, we haven't specifically reached out to any, you know, uh, user communities like computer science department um, or astronomy or anything like that. So I'm thinking we probably should. Thank you. Uh, Blake? Uh, I'm kind of the opposite. I do nothing but outreach. Um, and in fact, I'm in the libraries right now with our data viz wall trying to work on that. Um, so we teach software and data carpentries, and we also teach an intro to the HPC. Um, when we teach those at least once a quarter, but we have a fairly large community here of trainers, so we can sometimes teach that as much as once a week, especially at the beginning of the season. Uh, those often have a, you know, intro to HPC, uh, like in using open on demand, either through the Jupyter Notebooks or through our studio server. Um, and so that's been really successful because you just teach people how to use the machine while you're teaching them everything else um, and that way they already know how to use the HPC by the time they've learned how to code or how to do data management or any of that stuff. Um, we also have a number of um, kind of data science institutes and um, other groups on campus and they use our materials um, to do those trainings as well and so we have people who just kind of you know that do kind of outreach naturally through those mechanisms. Um, and honestly, again, just because everything is in a browser and well described and easier to approach and kind of easier to play with, uh, a lot of people find it naturally through our docs um, and they prefer that to SSHing into a terminal and submitting batch jobs through a text editor, you know, kind of thing. Thank you. Robert? Yep. So uh, I, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but really what I like to do is live demos. And this is um, the, the first platform that I'd say that uh, I have yet to have an issue. Um, I've probably just jinxed myself, but uh, um, I, this, this platform really lends itself well to um, just opening up your browser, showing people how to get in, and showing them how easy it is, and you know, just starting with questions. So as an example, yesterday I went to attend an a Intro to Slurm uh, seminar. The instructor didn't show up, so I took that as an opportunity to jump up and teach people Slurm, but where I started was open on demand. And so, you know, I, it, it was great because the people that were there were new to HPC. And, you know, here I was able to show them how to get into the cluster and uh, talk about Slurm. So it was, it was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Well, okay, I'll just, I will concur with what Bob just said. 
and then I'll let Katia <laughs> add add to it. Yeah. So we uh, for outreach we uh, we haven't been doing anything special. Uh, it it uh, by word of mouth I would say uh, right. Uh, we we didn't do anything special because we are not we are not considering ourselves yet in production mode everything works mike made everything work so beautifully that i actually made uh the word out before he could finish um installing that and people started to to uh to use it before we could actually test it completely and the more uh people i work with uh, the the more people use it uh, and uh, I think once we uh, go through all uh, pro probably starting new year or in a couple of months we will add uh, the link to our welcome email uh, just like uh, Alan said and uh, we uh, we will be teaching our classes of you know, using on demand and I don't think we will need any special uh, uh, um, events or special emails to encourage people to do that because uh, from my experience uh, everything went uh, so far with our users so smoothly they love it and uh, they just will keep using it and share the news with others in their group okay so the next question is do you have any tips or tricks to share uh, such as uh, custom interactive apps interface customizations and others and we'll start with Alan he probably has all the trick tricks <laughs> I will I will reiterate what I said earlier in that we uh, have a lot of institutional knowledge and not necessarily uh, really a stellar documentation so there's a lot of features a lot of things that we run in production or are are developing here at OSC that um, we haven't necessarily made other people aware of or we assume people just naturally know. So do not hesitate, please, to reach out to us via discourse, via email. However, if you have a question because we want to know, we might already have a solution for it or we might um, uh, be developing it. And this whole groups thing um, is a good example of that. If you look, I actually talked about the group permissions thing in the the answer in the document that I created earlier this week, and we got it in the chat just now. So, thank you, Sean. So I can answer uh, the uh, tips thing real quickly. Uh, mostly, my tip is just to ask. You know, there was the, the mailing site. Now there's discourse, and so I, I think what's worked best for me is just targeting um, OSC staff as well as now the growing community has really been valuable in getting uh, some some really great feedback. And I guess. Um, were we also talking about uh, uh, features coming up? Did we combine these two things? Uh, well, improvements. Yeah, it's custom inter interactive apps, uh, interface customizations. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you can. Yeah, sure. So uh, just features I would like to see really just comes down to meeting expectations of people that now have been using cloud services for a decade. Uh, you know, everything's ubiquitous. It's always available. It's browser and plug-in independent. So what people have asked me uh, considerably is, you know, persistent sessions. They want to be able to start a MATLAB or an R or a Jupyter um, for the next six days, just like they would on the command line. And they have expressed the expectation that if they log out or their computer crashes, they come back and that's still running. Um, that has been one of the main things. And they also expect, you know, why can't I cut and paste one to 10 terabytes of files in the interface and come back a week later and have it working. And so these are all reasonable expectations. I'm not sure they're reasonable to solve, but um, I, I think it's very interesting to see the, the difference. Persistent shell stuff is coming soon. Good, excellent. I, I definitely suspected that. And it's my fault for actually allowing users to request, you know, 600 hours in their R session before thinking it through. I, I never expected anyone would, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Blake? Yeah, I, I would never not expect researchers to do something if you allow them to. Uh, that's been my experience anyway. Um, 
I don't know if I have any tips or tricks. Uh, we do have some clever kind of interactive environments for desktops, again, because of our astronomy and GIS um, you know, uh, groups. Um, this has been mostly put together by our researchers. And so um, on the list of improvements, um, I actually, I, one of my improvements I wanted was tighter integration with XD mod. So it sounds like that's solved. That's wonderful. Um, I think that was what one of the things that y'all showed. But uh, going along those lines, um, like you know, when you log into Open On Demand, you get kind of or in our in our uh, on demand um, implementation, you get just kind of a blank screen that says Open On Demand. So those metrics about like uh, they give users context about you know how much allocation they have, how many jobs maybe their group have run or are running right now or queued. Um, like those kind of things would be really wonderful to present as people come into the environment. And that way they kind of have a sense of what's going on on the, our HPC machines, um, who in their group is using time, how they're using it, um, and just kind of setting those expectations as they walk in. Um, but it sounds like that's on the, the roadmap, so that'd be wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. Um, we have a, we're moving to pretty much an entirely container-based solution for our analysis software. And so treating containers, singularity, or whatever you, what have you, as sort of first-class citizens would be wonderful. Um, and I look forward to the improvements in the file system um, because the file system is really wonderful. There's a lot of like simple upload and simple download things that people really like. Uh, data transfer is still the number one thing that we help people with as they walk into the door. Um, and then dependencies is the number two thing um, <laughs> that we help them with when they walk in the door. Yeah. Thank you, Blake. I, I have to uh, cut short you, uh, and I'm sorry about that. We are already uh, two, uh, two minutes uh, past uh, the time. Some people need to go and join other meetings. I um, There are one question that uh, remained. Are there any improvements you'd like uh, the OOD developers to work on? And I think Alan already answered that question. Please send him uh, any wishes uh, that, uh, that uh, you would like to implement. And as for tricks, I'll very briefly answer for Mike. He, uh, every time someone asks him to do something, for example, to, uh, to display a time that was left uh, for the session, because uh, you know you request the time to, to work with our studio with something else, uh, he uh, or with Jupiter or with desktop. Uh, so Mike, uh, based on those requests, are trying to um, to implement those tricks, and they work wonderfully. Uh, but uh, please send your questions and uh, uh, requests for improvement to Alan. And uh, on this note, I'll uh, give back Mac to Clear and Bob. And uh, the top number of participants today was 100, which is great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for this wonderful session. Yeah, we actually hit our session limit. We didn't know that we actually had a 100. Uh, 100. Yes, it was 100. <laughs> so we're going to apologize to everybody who couldn't get on the call. Um, but I uh, want to thank everybody. Um, and thank you, Katya. Thank you. Uh, Bob, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Caleb, or sorry, Blake. I love that it says Caleb um, and Sean. Um, so and, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, if I am, you can actually uh, you know, throw me under the bus next time you see me. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, next month, I think we have Tim Middlecoop who will be um, our presenter. Um, and uh, we'll have a, a rotating panel of of hosts with our steering committee. And uh, definitely look, uh, sign in if you haven't already, so we can get you on the mailing list, uh, post questions, we'll make sure that we do a follow-up. And uh, Claire, can you think of anything else? Nope, I think that's good. Just thanks everybody. Very cool that we hit our record. Absolutely, all right. Good. Goodbye everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Take care. the meeting that started five minutes ago so I thank you very very much. Okay, thank you. Hey. Yes. I'm not gonna be in tomorrow. Yes. Uh
and then you're gonna. Then, I won't then, see when uh, you're going I, I, Are you gonna I, be here next? No. At no. all? Oh no, I will be. I will be Monday and Tuesday. Okay. They will be all. Can will you be water here. that on yes, Tuesday? I will. Okay, and I'll water your plants when I get back. Thank you. Okay. All right.